the All Press Podcast with Connor McKenna, Eric Bacramella, and Sean Starr starts now. All right. Welcome back. It's a new edition of the show. All dressed on your favorite podcast provider, Connor, Eric, Sean. Everybody's here today. Sean doing an outdoor edition. Yep. Very nice. Yep. Live from uh, Wrigley Field today. You like the I, ivy here? There, I believe you are in ivy. right field, yeah. correct? You are in right I, field. Very nice. I am. I'm waiting for Steve Bartman's triumphant return to Wrigley Field. So I can okay. welcome him back. That poor, that poor, lifelong Chicago Cub fan. Oh, well, I think so- it works. It works here. Oh. So I'll pretend that I'm Moises Alou because really pigmentation wise, it makes perfect sense. Here, watch this. <laughs> <laughs> for those watching the podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And you're and Connor's Alex Gonzalez. So thank God no one's talking about me booting that ball at short. Thank God. Yeah. <laughs> He's more of an Anthony Rizzo kind of guy, I think, but okay. More of a more of a Frank Rizzo kind of guy. Hey, Rizzo. 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 Uh, so guys, uh, let's get right into it. The Canadians take a one nothing series lead over the Toronto Maple Leafs and make people like us and me look terrible in the process for having the gall to criticize these lineup decisions going in. Everything came up, Dominic Ducharme and Mark Bergevin, or at least other than the power play for the <laughs> Canadians last night. Uh, so was everybody who criticized these lineup decisions wrong? Eric? The criticism was deserved, and we don't know how the game would have looked if different players were in the game. But that aside, mm-hmm. all that matters is the W. All that matters is the win. All that matters is today, all three of us are feeling super duper happy. Our nipples are hard. This is a great, great day. But no doubt moving forward, certain adjustments will have to be made, particularly because Jake Evans is out. But I think the criticism, Sean, was deserved. And it's still an open question as to which Habs lineup is the best Habs lineup. I love you, brother. I love you. Um, I, I, I love only you too. It's, a, it's, a poli- it's such a great politician answer you just gave us to Connor's question. Because, look, you, you can kick the tires out of me. I took the Leafs in four. Eric, you had – there's no way Eric Stahl could play. Eric Stahl can't play. Eric Stahl can't play. I could tell you the game probably doesn't play the way it did if you asparagus cocking him, he's playing. I mean, the, 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 especially in the first period, how Eric Stahl performed. Let's remember, this team won 55% of the faceoffs. They dramatically dominated Toronto in the faceoff circle. There's no way, Connor. I do not believe the game plays out the same way it did. And Eric Stahl was huge in that game. We were wrong there. And it's okay to say we were wrong because we were. Yes. I, I mean, I don't see how you can look at it any other way. Uh, this was a massive vindication of Dominic Ducharme. Uh, of the decisions that he made with the lineup. I'm perfectly fine admitting that. Uh, it went much better than I thought it would. And of course, I think, you know, the caveat's always there. And even as I shredded the Canadians for their sort of loser mentality, mm-hmm. I stand by that. And as a big picture view, uh, I don't think that the long-term uh, health of the, of the franchise is going to be necessarily positively affected uh, if they have success against the Leafs. But man, oh man, was that fun. Uh, what a game last night. We waited 42 years for it. It lived up to the hype. And we also started with one of the most scary moments I've ever seen in a hockey game. Mm. Uh, it took me back to Max Pacioretty at the Bell Center or with Sedano Chara uh, a decade ago. It took me back to, I don't know if you guys will remember this, but uh, Mike Knubel running into Brendan Shanahan in a playoff game uh, that was probably 15, maybe even 20 years ago. Shanahan was out on the ice. And Tavares, I mean, God, the, the, the reaction of the trainers, the, uh, the, the, just the look on his face, the blood running down, the uncertainty in the moment, uh, horrifying. I, I don't think anybody here is going to come out with a hot take like Corey Perry did that on purpose. Uh, you'd have to be pretty intellectually dishonest to come up with something like that, even though it was Corey Perry. Let's yeah. talk a little bit about the fight. Uh, a lot of people have takes on this. Eric, I haven't heard yours yet. Uh, what did you think of the uh, of the fight that uh, followed the incident involving Corey Perry and John Tavares? Well, first, that that moment cast a shadow over the whole game. And while we were all, all so happy the Habs won that game and it was a fun game to watch, it just sort of lingered in the background because it looked so bad. And I also wonder why the trainer tried to sit him up or allowed him to sit up. There are protocols in place put in place by very expensive lawyers that you don't let someone in that circumstance who suffered that type of event, try and sit up. He's got to be immobilized, stay on the ice. Uh, Insofar as the fight, 
Felino said he didn't see the replay. That's a bit of a surprise to me because there are 47 iPads on the bench. So you get a chance to see it. And, you know, there was about a 10 minute delay or if, if not more. Mm-hmm. I was a little bit put off by the fight. I understand the idea notion behind it. Perry kept saying it was an accident. It was an accident. He didn't want to fight, but he ended up doing it because Perry is old school. But that moment struck me slightly at a step. I, I, my hope and expectation is that in the NHL, Sean, we can get yeah. away from that kind of stuff. I just, I did not see it as a necessary moment in that game. Yeah. I, I want to believe that too. Right. And, and, um, I'm not one that that shouts from the mountaintop to have fighting removed from the game. I've I've maintained though that a fight like like last night's uh, was absolutely ludicrous, embarrassing. It was it was ugly. It was disturbing. It was unnecessary. Um, but then I watched the players' reaction. Both teams, right? You saw that they were all kind of horseshoed around the fight, uh, slamming sticks on the ice. You know, the code is the code is the code, and and uh, they abide, man. Uh, they love that code, and, and as long as as these players, I think the majority of them continue uh, to have that mindset. I think uh, a fight like last night, as unjustified and unwarranted as it was. Uh, it's just going to hang around. It's just going to hang around. And Connor and I today on the TSN 690 morning show uh, with our respective ladies watching the game uh, in our own homes, both had the same reaction. It was like, why there's, there's loud voices reacting with loud voices, Connor, to, to what they were watching. It was extremely uncomfortable. Mm. And, you know, the, the other thing was, and my cousin texted me on this and saying, you know, a seven and nine year old kid who were watching the game with him, Uh, explaining to them and just having finished explaining that it was an accident what happened there and it's just it's an unfortunate outcome and everybody's sorry and then to have that happen right after that's a difficult conversation to try to explain to your kid why these guys are wailing on each other given the Mm -hmm. fact that everyone knows it was an accident so why is this happening you know I and that's that's I just I think that's a problem for hockey basically that that still happens but in this game I, my reaction to this is a little bit different. I believe that what happened between Foligno and Perry completely lowered the temperature and was essentially required in the moment. If that doesn't happen, then the Leafs are feeling like they need to go out and take justice into their own hands. Uh, mm. If they feel that uh, Perry, there, there was any intent, or even if they don't, that maybe they need to try to take somebody else's head off or something else needs to go down. Or maybe there's a, there's a bounty situation after the game and the following game, something goes wrong. And that's even worse for hockey. I believe that as stupid as that fight was, and ultimately I don't think that it needs to be in the game, but as long as the, the sort of the, the code or whatever it is, is in there, that moment between Foligno and Perry and Perry taking a few shots and looked like he kind of refused to really punch Foligno for the most yeah, part. I agree. I think it does. It takes the game down a few levels and just allows, and I, people were still shell-shocked, but at least they got back to hockey rather than everything being, oh boy, uh, are guys going to go wait a little bit longer before finishing checks? Are things going to get a little dirtier? It didn't happen. And I think the fight is the reason why. But like, what about redefining the code, right? As an example of, let's say the, the incident occurs as it did. Sherratt on Tavares, the, the leg protection, the pad of Corey Perry collides with the head of John Tavares and they don't, and they don't fight. But they go into the room and they see the replay and, and they can look at it and the takeaway is, oh, that was an accident. There's no way that was deliberate. Does the code tell us that they still have to fight in the second period? Does revenge need to be uh, their priority to avenge what happened to their captain, win it for Johnny, as Wayne Simmons said between periods? Like, I don't know where the code rests because I want to think that these guys who've been playing hockey their entire lives can look at the replay and say that, well, to hell with the code, that wasn't deliberate. So, so I, I don't know how they interpret it. I, I have two things. First, Sean, in the background, is that your wife pretending she's a bird, or are those actual birds chirping? I assume those are no, birds that's chirping. Her, that's her. Uh, We're like Augusta. We fabricate these noises. So, you know, Connor, I agree with what you're saying fundamentally, that that fight allowed the situation to diffuse. But the reason the diffusion was necessary was as a result of what we of how hockey culture is constructed. And that's the issue. And that's the fundamental flaw at this point in time. I was watching the game with my seven and four year old who wanted me to change a channel because the Tavares situation was hard for them to watch. And then that was followed by a fight really. And then an unnecessary fight. Now, look, I'm against fighting in the game, but this is not the type of fight 
that I advocate against fighting. This this was different. I just think it was, I thought that Foligno's sentiments in this case were slightly misplaced, but still altogether aligned with the hockey culture. That's why it's kind of out of step with where we are today. Consumers don't necessarily want that. You've got to give consumers what they want. Yeah, and you know, I, you don't have to be four or seven years old to be uncomfortable. I mean, that was, again, uh, it's just, uh, there was a time, at, you know, we, I said this, we, Darren Dreger brought this up and I was thinking back and remember the announcer, the announcers first said um, it, that the skate, he had been hit in the head with a skate uh, and then he's bleeding and you're seeing, and I don't know where, is, is he cut? Is, did he take a skate to the neck? Uh, the, the trainers are so panicked that it is your, it's, it was, I mean, I was rattled. I, mm -hmm. you know, for the rest of just like, and I can't even imagine you yep. think about his, his brothers, his teammates, uh, Kyle Dubas's reaction. You think about his, what his wife or his children watching the game. I mean, what are they thinking? Uh, there's just, there's a lot that goes through your head in a moment like that. Yeah. Well, that's why, you know, you the, the hockey teams and they talk about the bond that these guys have, right. It's, it's, it is a special bond because they, the, the one thing that teams, when they do it well, they put playing for their teammate ahead of playing for themselves. Right. And, and that creates that bond. And that's why I think you, you know, you see that emotional reaction and how, you know, I'm always uh, in awe of, of, these guys and their their psychology and how they're able to separate a lot of things but like that's almost impossible that's almost impossible because of how the game was played the uncertainty knowing that uh, you know do you tell your players that the captain was taken to the hospital or do you do you try to leave it in the background and and get these guys to refocus on the second period and the remaining minutes of that hockey game and it's i, I again i think it's almost impossible knowing that the uncertainty of your captain, your brother, uh, your leader is unknown. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the impact now uh, that this has on the ice. And it's a significant one. Uh, John Tavares, not only is he one of their best players, he was so hot to, for them down the stretch. Um, and we've seen it. We've watched him score goals on the Canadians. I mean, this is, he's one of the, one, one of the best players going to the hall of fame someday. How much does this change? Presumably, we don't know, but I mean, you'd have to think he's going to miss time and it'd be surprising to see him play again in this series, at least. Um, how much, Sean, do you think the absence of John Tavares changes the complexion of this series? I think big time, Connor. I really do. Um, because it's a now, you know, we talk so much about tandems, whether it's Tavares and Nylander, uh, Marner and Matthews, you know, the one, two, and then you fill in a little spot now. Right. And so what's the, what's the answer? You're not going to separate Austin Matthews. Um, as far as your go-to line, does that mean more minutes for Joe Thornton who struggled in game one, more minutes for Jason Spezza by committee and trying to find the right partner while the Montreal Canadiens brought a completely different level of play to game one. So I do think it's a massive impact outside of, of the guy scoring goals. It's the trickle down effect and how it changes what Sheldon Keefe, the coach of the Leafs, Eric, had in store in his own mind of how he wanted this series to play out. Now it's completely up in the air. It definitely has an impact on the lines and it's an adverse impact on the lines for sure. But when you lose your captain like that, if he's, if he's a true captain of that team and Tavares is a true captain of that team, he leads by example. It can be really deflating. I think back to when Saku Koivu, I think it was, was it the Hurricanes in the playoffs where he got clipped and was out. And I remember watching that moment and at home you can feel the whole team just deflate. And so you lose that competitive edge that you had and you lose something. And I think the Leafs are going to struggle here, not from a line pairing perspective. They still have a lot of firepower, but I think they may struggle from an identity standpoint and from a leadership standpoint. And that's what the Leafs really need. Yeah, well, and, and right, it's gut check time here for Toronto. Uh, we yeah. know this team's history in the playoffs um, and it being kind of a negative one. And look, nothing is set in stone. And I'm not, I'm not saying the Leafs are toast or anything by any stretch mm. of the imagination, but yeah. you lose your captain, that is going to have an impact, uh, you think, on the very obvious just which players you have available and probably from an, an emotional well, standpoint. Or it can, you know, maybe it becomes a bit of a rallying cry. Mm. we'll see i'm a little bit more skeptical on that but mm. uh, either way i do think that moment is gonna be felt for the remainder it's of a the moment and beyond. it's a moment yeah. mm -hmm. it's a significant wow. material moment as right. is the power play 
<laughs> what about for the power? What are we going to say about the power play? I mean, I, I, you know, leave it to Guy Boucher to break it down for me. I, I, I it's absurd to me that they had a week yes. to get ready and that, that, that those are the looks they brought to the zone entries, guys. I mean, the inability to get the puck into the zone, these guys think it's in 1987, I think, with, with what mm-hmm. they're doing. It's, it's, crazy but they'll get a mulligan they won the game despite the fact that their power play was so bad uh thanks in large part to uh paul byron's contribution shorthanded but what about uh, what about josh anderson uh, we see him in this game we heard the uh i think it was the tampa bay lightning talking about this a couple of years ago when the blue Jackets swept them they had no answer for josh anderson now I, I we look at this leafs team and, and look at other teams around the league the way that anderson played in game one eric do the Leafs have an answer for what Josh Anderson brings? Earlier this season, the Leafs, before they played the Habs, I think for the second or third time, they they expressly mentioned Josh Anderson. I've felt since the beginning, as many people have, that he's a potential player of impact, and we saw that last night. He, again, when he's on his game, when he is so engaged, he's a one-man wrecking crew. He was unstoppable yesterday. I think he scored that goal like 41 kilometers an hour or something. That's apparently what he was skating at, according to Sportsnet. Uh, he, he's, he's, he's so much fun to watch, but he's, he's equally effective, Sean. And when you have a guy like him on the ice who is a difference maker – by himself, the Canadians don't really have a lot of those guys. So that's a big, big difference. Uh, he was he was a human wrecking ball. I mean, he set the bar as far as the intensity to level for the Canadians. And, and Wayne Simmons with those skinny little legs, he's lucky because <laughs> he would have separated his torso from his lower body. There's no way Wayne Simmons has the girth in his thighs to sustain, to, sus- uh, you know, to be able to absorb a hit like the one Anderson tried to put on him in the first period. The goal was special. And this guy had no points in 11 games. So to see and, and know that his role, and he admitted it post game because he knows that he has to be the guy that sets the energy level. And he did that. It's not an easy thing to do, you know, to, to meet that level of expectation. And it was surprising to me because I thought he was just a force in all areas of the game, but the box score reads three hits. Paul Byron had seven hits. Arturi Lekkanen had seven hits. But yet we're talking about the intensity, the jam that Josh Anderson brought. And that's one player, Connor, that, you know, we've been covering hockey um, and, and on the All Sports radio station at TSN 690 for a long time. I don't think we've ever covered a player like Josh Anderson playing mm. for the Montreal Canadiens. Mm-hmm. No way. The way that the way that he skates, uh, the way that he can just blow through guys, and we saw it on Byron with Byron on Sandy and on the game winning goal too. Yeah, that, that level of speed where it just looks like the other guy is sinking into the ice <laughs> as you blow past him, it's an amazing thing to see. Isn't it? Yeah. Isn't it cool, guys? It doesn't matter. He's the one player you don't really care who he's playing with when he's on his right. game. It doesn't matter because he somehow separates from both teams. And creates a scoring chance for himself. It's a wonderful thing to see. But can the Habs use this somehow on the power play? Can they use him to push the middle and gain those own entries that are so labored, kind of like you said? I mean, those own entries are so tough to watch. This power play, not to get too analytical, is pee pee caca. Whoa. I don't know. Like, how do we fix the power play? Like, what do we do? This power play, we've been talking about this for what, three years now? Ten. Yeah. Just like 10 years. Yeah. No, no, they 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 had some pretty decent power plays more yeah. recently than ten years ago. It's since since Markov left. Yep, it's just. Yep. And congrats, by the way, to Andre Markov on the new gig. Uh, he's an assistant coach in the KHL. It was announced yeah. early, early. Oh, this morning. yes. Uh, so no, those we can dispel those Markov. Yeah, rumors. You know what? I'm, I I have no idea how to fix this power play. The one thing that will definitely help your power play, if and when you get a sustained pressure in the offensive zone. It's hit the bloody goaltender, man. Stop killing your own penalties by ringing it around the boards because your lack of accuracy. Take your time. Shorten your stroke. You know, P.K. Subban, when, uh, in his early days as a Canadian, was criticized because he had such an extensive, long backswing, and he would be off target. So you shorten it up. Derek Jeter used to shorten a swing when he got older. Like, just shorten the stroke. It's more important to put it on net than it is anything else. Yeah, but give Sean, your team Sean, a chance. But, but I think the Canadians, once they're set in the offensive zone, they are, they are creating some scoring chances like other teams. The issue is is getting into the zone and setting up. And it seems like this, this whole play about dropping it back, you know, to, to tar whoever, and just everybody's already set on the Leafs blue line. And so it, these zone entries are, are, are going to be heavily contested. They're so predictable. They're so labored, so lamentable. You've got to just, you've got to engage and come in with speed. You, you can't, 
looked as reluctant as they looked on these zone entries. Taking How many their times time. did they miss the net last night? They How spent 15 seconds c- c- contemplating a zone entry. It's insane to me. Anyway, you don't have to choose just one thing. It can be both things and many others as well, I'm sure. Uh, Carey Price, so <laughs> we just talked about Josh Anderson. Uh, can we say, I mean, it's only one game. But when it comes to Anderson, I think we can say that who cares? It doesn't matter about what happened in the last dozen or so games. With Carey Price, too, uh, anybody who was expecting that Carey Price was going to be able to come in and flip a switch and be his very best self, that happened last night. That was the best game he's played since against Philly or against Pittsburgh in the bubble last year, in my view. I've always been a believer in this, that him more than anybody else, he can flip a switch and find another level. He has been great in the playoffs for a long time. What are we to make of this? I mean, is this, can we expect this level of goaltending from Carey Price? Is it, is it safe to have that expectation, Sean? I think so. I think it is. Carey's back, baby. Let's call it, man. Um, because you're right. I mean, the switch does exist. I think we can put put that argument to bed. We saw it on uh, multiple occasions in one game. And the fact that he's, you know, turned aside 35 shots, finished the night with a, a 972 save percentage when, you know, he was, he was rocking a below 900 and, and a 3.5 goals against in four games against Toronto. The stats were extremely unflattering, but you know, if we go back to, you know, meaningful games, playoff tournaments, what up loose chilling on the couch in the background. And I'm thinking about, like international play um, and how well this guy has done, even going back to when he won a Calder with the Hamilton Bulldogs. Like, I guess he has this unique ability, Eric, that uh, outside of the regular season, when his team's in a, maybe a comfortable spot, somewhat of a comfortable spot that they coast. And then he kicks it into the next gear. Cause even Connor against the New York Rangers, when they didn't score for him, he was fantastic. Mm. But they gave him two goals and run support, and he did the rest. I mean, if this is the version of Carey Price, then uh-oh, uh-oh, Toronto. I'd say that Carey Price isn't back as much as what we're seeing is playoff price. He just seems to lock in of late over the past you know, few playoff series, locks in in the playoffs and is incredibly effective. That save off Mitch Marner was absolutely... Oh. Not only timely, it was insane. I mean, but he makes that look easy. That's the thing. He's got no wasted movements in his technique. It's seamless. Mm-hmm. It's graceful. And I'll say this about Carey Price. Even when he's not playing well, when I'm watching him, I'm fully aware that I'm watching a goalie with a, a type of style that I love that I may never see again. There's this level of grace to how Carey Price plays that I personally find very compelling. Yeah, and uh, I think he got three posts and crossbars in the game. Which mm. was, uh, which yeah, was yeah. Well. Uh, but uh, hey, you got to be lucky to be good. You got to be good to be lucky. Uh, firm believer for sure in all of that. Uh, all right, any closing thoughts ahead of the weekend? Game two, Saturday night. Uh, anything else on the Canadians and the Leafs or uh, 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 anything else at all you feel like well, you need to say? The one thing I, I guess I would add, even though it isn't technically must win, I guess if you're a believer or went into the game, Connor, I guess kind of like you did thinking that if you can plant a seed of doubt because you think the Leafs are fragile and haven't gotten out of the first round in almost two full decades, that it's mission accomplished in two ways. You stole home ice advantage by getting a split and you planted that seed by winning the opening game of the series. And now they don't have a captain. Um, And we'll see about how tough this team is and whether, you know, to you, to both you and Eric and your earlier point about the Tavares injury being a rallying cry, a galvanizing moment in this series, um, we're going to see as early as Saturday night uh, whether this team is as fragile as some people thought they were and if that seed has been planted now. I'm very, I'm going to be curious to see how they respond. Interesting. Yeah, you know, there's a few things, I guess, we'll see kind of what you were talking about before, Connor, to the extent to which Tavares' absence, I assume he'll be absent, will have an impact on this team and uh, we'll see how it, it affects him. Hope to see more from the top line Gallagher, uh, Tatar, uh, Dano. Interesting to see if, if Kaki Yanami comes in to replace Jake Evans. That makes sense, I guess. I mean, you want to replace a centerman with a centerman. Um, and Suzuki woke up halfway through the game yesterday and began to look really good in the third period. So I expect really good things from Suzuki in game two. He needs Caulfield to get better. Yeah, I mean, they were born to play together. But I don't I know if you're if you're the coach, do you put in a centerman? But if you put in Kakinemi on the wing, then you've got to really reshuffle those lines more fundamentally than if you just what replace you Evans with Kakinemi. What do you do, Connor? No, Jake Evans played less than eight minutes last night. 
Um, hope that uh, he's going to be okay for game two. That's the first thing I do. Uh, I probably know at this point one way or the other. Yep. Uh, other than that, uh, you got the personnel. Wasn't that a great moment after the game, seeing all the kids in the suits and all the black aces lined up in the tunnel uh, to congratulate them all coming off the ice? I, mm. I, I love moments like that. Did uh, you guys notice that least uh, black ace? Was he drinking a beer? Did you guys know they flashed up to where the, the Leafs young players weren't playing? Uh, and true. one guy had a glass bottle. He had a glass. I said, whoa, is this guy drinking a beer on game day? You can't get a glass <laughs> bottle beer at a hockey game. Not Even if, maybe in a loge. Yeah, he was like, well, he was in his little loge with his other yeah. teammates. Mm, I, I bet it was BioSteel or something. <laughs> um, no sugar. I usually okay. drink champagne at games, but that will come in a glass because obviously it's champagne. Mm-hmm. A flute, I believe it's called a flute. <laughs> Whoa, fancy time. Fancy well time. said. I'm so okay. rich, I don't even know the terms. That's amazing. There's no said. need. Uh, let's talk about no hitters in Major League Baseball. I had to ask Sean this morning to make sure that there wasn't a no hitter last <laughs> night. And, and there wasn't. Uh, amazing that there's been how many? Seven? Six. Six. Sorry. And the one that didn't count. The one that didn't count. There's actually been seven as far as I'm concerned, but officially there's been six. Uh, Eric, the no hitter used to be a mythical kind of amazing thing. And uh, one of those, one of those baseball things that you got really excited about and, Oh, we better change the channel and find out what happens here. Uh, There's never been more than eight in a season. I believe the number is, and that happened in 1888. That's the last time, and we're, we're well on our way to more than that. Uh, so uh, give me your thoughts, Eric, on the uh, plethora, the smorgasbord of uh, no-hitters in baseball this year. Typically, a no-hitter is something to be celebrated, uh, mm-hmm. obviously, and it still is something to be celebrated. It's a huge, huge deal, particularly this season. The guys getting no-hitters are you know, two, three, four guys in the rotation, and they're not aces. Uh, but yeah. we're at seven no-hitters 90 days into the season. On a, In a good year, you've got about five to seven no-hitters across the entire season. This run of no hitters is a reflection of what ails baseball. These no hitters are different. They're different because players are so focused on launch angle, so focused on going deep. There's no shame in striking out. Baseball clearly has an action problem and it is manifested in the manner in which these, these pitchers are getting these no hitters at an unprecedented rate. It's, it's unfortunate, but it's a reflection of where baseball is today. And it's, it's, there are not enough balls in play. And with the shift as well, the the shift is a significant issue. But bottom line is 35% of the plays end with a ball not in play, home run, strikeout, or walk. And Mm -hmm. these, 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 the series of no hitters is simply, Sean, a reflection of the challenges that baseball is facing. And that is baseball has a substantial action problem. They do. They really do. And, and we'll see um, how they sort themselves out through, through, through this kind of problematic situation. I mean, you, you, you know, if we talk about the juice baseballs and now they've taken the juice out of the baseballs, um, are they going to change the, the dynamics of the mound when, when Gibson was a pitcher, uh, they had to, cause he was such a dominant, dominant performer. Guys couldn't hit him. So they had to give the edge back to the batter. So baseball definitely has to do something. And, 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 you know, I like what you said about the, 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 the mythical aspect of the no hitter, because it was that way for me when I was a kid, I was a, I loved collecting baseball cards and upper deck was, was the brand, right. That I always chose. And I would, I would go all the time and and buy a pack of upper deck cards. And I remember they had the Nolan Ryan series. How many no hitters this guy threw in his career. It was like, Oh, I'm going to get the whole set. And it was like, Nolan Ryan was the strikeout, no hit King of my, of my youth. And so every morning, like twice this week, it was like, no hitter, no hitter. It's taken um, the, the special element that used to exist. And now it's just, Oh, no hitter, Corey Kluber. Cool. What's next? You know, like there's be, for me, there's nothing beyond the headline that Rondon threw a no hitter Kluber threw a no hitter. It's like, Oh, okay. There's another no, no in the bigs. That's six now. Cool. I'm working on my, uh, George top, four. Kluby, top four here. Um, and, uh, I said all I have to say about the no hitters. So I did want to mention our YouTube channel, uh, the All Dress Podcast YouTube channel. Thank you to everybody who subscribed and checks it out. And uh, to our commenters, 
as well, uh, many of whom uh, agreed with our assessment of the Canadians' uh, terrible lineup plan, uh, maligning mm. the youngsters heading into game one. Appreciate you guys for that, including Michael uh, talking about the only possible positive excuse for this move is to burn a game, lose game one badly, which gives them cover to bring in the young kids and not apologize for it. Huh. So that's obviously not what ended up happening. Uh, Keenan says, nobody mentioned, shall we dance in our JLo top four? Keenan, that is correct. Nobody mentioned. Correct. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I didn't. I didn't anticipate that Mike Keenan would have been a J Lo fan. But hey, great right, Mike, baby. Keenan McEckern. I like that name a lot. Um, uh, so thank you to everybody, Stefan. Always good for a comment or two as well. And uh, keep them coming, you guys. Uh, we see them all. Uh, we appreciate them for sure. And thanks for engaging uh -oh. with us here. You guys hear the chopper? No. They're coming to get me. Yeah. Is this, is that they're going to take you out to uh, Kanawaki for your, for your round there? <laughs> VIP, baby, it's Friday. <laughs> I don't know if the FBI choppers come to get you as much as they're coming to ask you questions about me. You know, the oh, beard and stuff. They got the beard, so. Oh, my affiliation? Yes, that's right. I, I knew you'd You are you your friends. You are who you surround yourself with. <laughs> uh, all right, George Clooney top four. Our top Let's four go. George Clooney movies. Why? Uh, because he was in Out of Sight, I guess. And that's why this was Eric's idea and Eric initiative. I personally don't like going back to back with the same uh, types of, uh, of top fours. And I will make an exception for my dear friend. Oh, well, I, I guess. Thank home. you for your support. That's very nice. Of you. <laughs> <laughs> somewhat, uh, somewhat so ambiguous support. But who's uh, going first? Well, if you want me, I, I can go first just because okay. uh, it's a topic you don't necessarily want to do. So and you also uh, paid I me to go say, first. I didn't say that. All I said at was at this I time, at this time, you're right. You're right. OK, so uh, I'm breaking the rule on, on number four. And my favorite George Clooney movie is a TV show is The Facts of Life. I loved his moment oh. in that show. You take the good, take the bad, take them both. And there you have George Clooney. Fantastic. That was uh, one of his best performances before the age of 25. Hey, what other sitcom did he make uh, frequent appearances in? Uh, Friends. Roseanne. Oh, that's right. Yes, sir. That's where the mullet came from. Come very, on, very baby, nice. let's go. All right, number three, Ocean's Eleven, a yeah. studded cast, uh, and he's just very cool. And George Clooney, if you're a woman, you want to be with him. If you're a guy, you want to be friends with him. He's uh, terrific. That movie was great. And it was different, different pacing, uh, lots of flair, lots of great energy. Number uh, two on my list, Up in the Air, Life is Better with Company. We do this podcast because in this pandemic, our company is somewhat restricted and my life is improved by virtue of being with you guys, even over Zoom. That movie was fantastic. I just love its thoughtful, deliberate, pensive approach. And number one on my list, a movie I've seen so many times and every time I see it, I revel in his brilliance, Three Kings. That movie was mm, absolutely movie. brilliant and frankly, ahead of its time and very few movies that are that old have aged that well. So Three Kings, mm. number one on my list. Good list. It's a good list. Uh, all right. Uh, I'll go next. Uh, number four on my list, Michael Clayton. Yeah. Oh, good one. And deliberate. I love that one. He's great. What a great finish to that movie. Uh, I now I'm not remembering her name, but the female lead in that film who plays sort of the evil uh, yes, CEO yes. lawyer for the awful Monsanto like corporation. Uh, Tilda Swinton is her name, and she well done. Uh, so that's number four. Number three, I'm going to go Three Kings, just like you, Eric. It's been a long time, but but stood out. And remember, this was one of the the, the roles that made Clooney. He was not not a star and not really a, a marquee name at the time, uh, but a big big turning point for him. Number two, I'm going to do Gravity. Uh, Gra oh yeah. I wish I'd seen it in the theater. Uh, I did. I loved it. I thought that I just still mm -hmm. now I watch it again. I think it's just a brilliant, brilliant piece of filmmaking. Uh, number one, same number one as last week. I'm going to go out of sight. I, it's mm -hmm. my, that's my favorite George Clooney movie. That's a good list. I like uh, it's a good list. Uh, you know, the, you know, the thing about Gravity is I loved watching Gravity's it, awesome. but it's not a movie I want to see again because it moved too slowly for me. Mm -hmm. Still pretty good, though. Holds yeah. up. Um, all right, so coming in at number four, all time, uh, leading us off because the cinematography, uh, the director of photography is so, so strong, filmed at beautiful locales with other celebrity cameos. George Clooney, 
Nespresso commercials. Uh, coming in at number four with the Danny DeVito, beautiful fountains in Italy, beautiful uh, cinematography, <laughs> gentlemen. How dare you, Cutter? How dare you? Uh, how, dare, how dare you? Be, how dare you besmirch the the integrity of the of the, of the Fab Four? Four of the Fab Four? Is is it, is yeah, it the Fab yeah, yeah. Four? Can we call it the Fab Four? Yeah, let's call it that. Lock it in. All right, so let's get serious then. Uh, Coming in at number three, I love this movie. I catch it whenever I can. It is Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? with John Turturro Mm. and others, a stellar cast. The music is good. His little, uh, he loves his little hair gel grease. He's got it throughout the course of the movie. It's a running joke, holds up very strong. Uh, Like Eric, Ocean's Eleven for me is a must on this list. Danny Ocean, super cool character. Um, Just a great franchise of films. And uh, number one is up in the air. Uh, I just like the human element element of it all uh his miserable job and how he handled it um so up in the air for me coming in hot at number one for my fab four con i want to ask you a question because your sister makes movies or she made a documentary i think called gifts was it gifts or gift excuse me the gift the gift and i did try and find it i still can't find it without having just gifts just just gifts uh is george clooney is he the kind of actor that does make movies better by adding him in a movie yes. and his thoughtful approach to acting. Can it really improve a movie or can anybody else do what he did in those movies? If anybody else could do it, then they would, wouldn't they? The, the, the thing about Clooney is, is uh, that I find so cool is that he really didn't hit it big until like his forties. Right. Yep. Uh, but he had that quality and he just, like you guys mentioned, the background guy and some sitcoms and he comes from like a showbiz family. Right. Uh, but no, oh, right. he's got that, uh, he's just got the, that, uh, that movie star quality, that je ne sais quoi. Mm-hmm. You can't put your finger on exactly what it is. It's, it's different almost for each and every one of them, but he most certainly has it. I find that he brings intelligence and thoughtfulness yep. to his roles and I think that's really appreciated. Like Matt Damon is similar in that way, and that he brings Matt that Damon. thought of it. <laughs> and does he like take every script? You get the sense that he like he takes every script that his agents says, "Hey, George, maybe you want to do this." Like I, I think he's good at picking his movies. Yeah. yeah well, Agreed. to that point, he's been in some very bad movies. Um, I'm looking at the bottom of the bottom. Yeah. Uh, Return of the Killer Tomatoes back in uh, 1988. Oh, come on now! I'm trying to make a name for himself. <laughs> Grizzly 2 Revenge. Uh, that I don't know. Uh, yeah, I never heard of it. What about uh, Batman and Robin? Yeah, that was the one of the worst movies of all right. time. Uh, the Monuments Men. Did anybody watch that? No. Damon Murray Goodman. I mean, with a cast like that, and he directed that one. And uh, then, of course, there's The Good German, which, as we all know, is an oxymoron. I'm kidding. Mm. Did so- you like The Descendants? I like that movie too. Yeah. That's a good flick. No, but honestly, other than that, his, his batting average is very high. Let's not forget he played Detective <laughs> Bobby Hopkins in uh, The Ooh. Golden Girls in episode, uh, I think, six. And what about two uh, or three? What about what was the name of his character in ER? Anybody? For, uh, for a Ross. Scene? Ross. Dr. Ross, I think. No, you're thinking of Ross Geller from Friends, Eric. That was. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure that, that Clooney went on a break after ER. No, I, I think it was Dr. Ross. I know. I was. I was oh. Previous, yeah. Uh, okay, I'll take your word for it. I don't remember. Uh, thank you. Uh, as always, a pleasure, boys. Enjoy the weekend. We'll check in after game two between the Canadians and the Leafs. Thanks for listening. Thanks for rating, subscribing, and uh, commenting. Any commentary, anything you'd like to hear us say, talk about, please let us know. And uh, Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Take care. Love you.